Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone that's with us tonight. Our number's down a little bit from this morning, but we're all here to worship and serve the Lord, so uh, hopefully you'll be edified by what I have to present to you tonight. Once again, I will continue to use the New King James Version of the Bible, and I welcome you to examine what I present to you so you can be sure that what I'm saying is proper and according to God's Word. Having said all that, uh, sin is common to mankind. If we were to take a religious survey, we would quickly see that many people have a lot of wrong impressions about what the Bible teaches on various subjects. Sins can result from having a lack of knowledge of God's Word, and this results in an improper application of the Scriptures to how we conduct our lives. Today we want to discuss various areas that involve misunderstandings among mankind in regard to God's Word. Therefore, the title of my sermon is, Sins Resulting by Not Knowing the Scriptures. While on earth, Jesus confronted those who tried to entangle him with their questions. If you turn to Matthew 22, verse 29, you'll see that Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Here we find Jesus addressing the religious leaders of the Sadducees in regard to a matter that exposed their ignorance of God's work. Even religious leaders can be wrong. Religious error is nothing new, and it had to be addressed by Jesus while here on earth. Likewise, we must deal with religious error today. However, we cannot deal with error unless we know and recognize it. What must we do to recognize error? Please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. To recognize error, the Apostle Paul gave us instructions. So in verse 15, it says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must be able to rightly divide God's word. If we are not diligent in the study of God's word, we will not be able to apply it to our lives in a proper manner. Thus, we will not be able to present ourselves approved to God. Ignorance of God's word and not knowing the scriptures will lead to sin in our lives. Therefore, we need to consult the Bible, which is the standard of all truth and what God expects of his children. The Apostle Paul stated in 2 Timothy, chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of god may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work the bible is the inspired word of god and contains everything we need to guide us to live in a way that is pleasing to Him. God's Word is complete and the absolute standard of truth. Now let us take a brief look at some common religious errors that are believed by some. Such errors that originate from not having sufficient knowledge of God's Word in regard to these matters. First, belief that children are born sinners. Some people believe that sins are passed from parents to children so that children are born sinners in need of baptism. There are some denominations that have and teach this belief. This is sometimes referred to as inherited or original sin. This belief is untrue because children are safe in God's sight, not sinners. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, But Jesus said, Let the little children come unto me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Little children 
are innocent. Children do not inherit sins from their parents. We only have to refer to Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. It says, Yet you say, Why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes and observed them. He shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. This scripture clearly states that every person is responsible for his or her own conduct. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30, it says, Therefore I, God, will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Also in Colossians chapter 3 verse 25, But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. The scripture clearly states that each will be responsible for their own actions. No one would bear the sins of another person. This being said, when should one be baptized? Only when one reaches the age of accountability and understands right from wrong. He understands that baptism is done to wash away their sins. Baptism is for consenting persons that believe that Jesus is the Son of God and understand that it's required to wash away their sins and required to be saved and to become a child of God. In Mark 16, 16, it says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Children are not born with the sins of their parents. Each person is accountable for their own actions. Children only need to be baptized when they reach an age of accountability as previously discussed. Next is the belief in predestination. Predestination is the idea that God choose certain ones to be saved without involving choice. This is a false belief. The Bible clearly teaches that salvation is available to all who believe and willfully serve God. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come, Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Also in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We can clearly, clearly see that belief is required to be saved. We also know that God is no respecter of persons. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I have per perceived that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever hears him and works righteousness is accept accepted by him. So God does not favor one person over another. The conditions to be saved are the same for everyone. Jesus loved us and died for all mankind. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. Each of us have an opportunity for the crown of life and a home in heaven. Not because we were predestined, but because we individually elect to serve God. The Apostle Paul stated in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Salvation is based on our choosing to serve God. To serve God, we must faithfully live our life in a manner that is according to His Word. 
God will not show partiality and desires that all be saved. We are not predestined by God to be saved or to be condemned. Each person has an opportunity to be saved, but must work out their own salvation. We must live a life in service to God and faithfully serve Him to the end of our earthly life. Then on the day of judgment, we will be judged individually based on our deeds on earth, whether good or bad, in the sight of God. After all have enjoyed the same opportunity to be saved, God will be a righteous judge and mete out final judgment. Next is the belief that once saved, always saved. This is sometimes called the impossibility of apostasy which is a desertion or departure from God and His Word. This doctrine holds that one cannot lose his salvation. Therefore, once saved, always saved. Thus, no matter what you do or how you live, heaven will be yours. Those who believe and practice this doctrine will be sadly surprised on the day of judgment. The Bible clearly teaches that one can be lost eternally after being in a saved condition. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, You have been estranged, alienated from Christ. You who tempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. If we are estranged from Christ, we are no longer in a proper relationship with Him. We do not abide in Christ. In John chapter 15, verse 6, if one does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they shall gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. We do not want to be found in a condition where we do not abide in Christ. God will be faithful to his promises. The question is whether we are faithful unto God. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The promise of heaven is conditional and depends on us being faithful unto death. We must not be found with an evil heart of unbelief on judgment day. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So be on alert at all times. We can be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another daily while we still have time to assure a proper relationship with God. The doctrine of once saved, always saves is a false doctrine that can condemn our souls on the day of judgment. The next is the belief that instrumental music can be used in worship. Some churches use a piano or organ in their worship unto God. They do this in spite of the Bible teaching that musical instruments are not acceptable unto God in worship. As a Christian, our worship to God is determined by the New Testament. We can only know, we can only know how to worship acceptably by its teachings. We cannot follow the doctrines of men. In Matthew chapter 15 verses 8 and 9 These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me and in vain they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. They were offering up vain worship therefore we need to look at the scriptures to be sure that our worship to God is acceptable. There are two kinds of music, vocal, which is singing, and instrumental. From the following scriptures, what music has God commanded? That's a question. Ephesians 5.19 states, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Then another example, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. God clearly states that he wants us to sing. God does not tell us to use musical instruments. When God specifies a way or kind 
to obey him is to do only what God says regarding the matter. Therefore we are to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. When God told Noah to build an ark out of gopher wood, the commanding of a certain kind of wood eliminated all others from being used in the construction of the ark. When definite instructions are given by God, we must comply completely. We are told to abide in the doctrine of Christ. In 2 John, chapter 9, 1, 2 John 9, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. So when God specified the kind of music that he wanted in worship, which is singing, that meant that it is all that he wanted. This eliminates musical, instrumental music of any kind, whether pianos, organs, or any other kind of instrument you may want to use. So we cannot find scriptural authority to use mechanical mus instruments in our worship. Adding instruments to our worship is adding to the word of God and renders our worship vain. Not knowing the scriptures regarding this matter could lead to sin and vain worship. A side note, we have seen instrumental music creep into the Church of Christ, some who've disregarded God's word and added it to their worship. So beware of that. There's a lot of them out in the nation today. Next, the belief that one church is as good as another. There are thousands of different religious organizations in North America. Some people think that it makes no difference which one you belong to. In other words, choose the one that best fits your lifestyle and minimize the restrictions on how you want to live. Mankind may not think it makes a difference, but the Bible teaches that it does make a difference. Therefore, we need to be sure that we belong to the one body or one church as found in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. And we see that the body here is the same as the church. Also in Colossians 1.18, And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Also in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, we see that Christ is the head of the church, and Savior of the body. If there is only one true body, then is Christ the Savior of all the thousands of different religious groups that we referenced? The answer is obviously no. Christ is only the Savior of the one body or one church. So what defines the one body? To be the one body of Christ, a church must follow the Bible. Any church that does not follow the Bible is not the Lord's church. Therefore, knowing the scriptures is essential in being, that, being sure that we are members of the one body as defined in the Bible, the Church of Christ. So do not let the lack of knowledge regarding the scriptures lead you astray. Next, the belief that baptism is not essential to be saved. Although many churches practice some form of baptism, most of them do not believe that baptism is a, a necessary thing that is done to be saved. Too many, too many churches, salvation comes at the point of faith, and baptism is just to show others that God has already saved you. Thus it is an outward sign of an inward grace. The scripture clearly refutes this belief and proves that it is false. The Bible teaches that baptism is essential to salvation and is one of the steps of obedience. We will look at some passages to see what baptism accomplishes or helps us to accomplish. First, we can be saved. In Mark 16, 16, who who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Also, we are baptized into Christ in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptism saves us. 
in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then we see that baptism washes away our sin. In Acts 22, verse 16, And now, while you waiting, arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Thus, baptism is only one step in the path of salvation, but is the culminating step of faith at which point our sins are forgiven. We get into Christ, and we are saved and added to the church. Now let us turn and read Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6 and 17 through 18 to see the importance of baptism. In Romans 6, 3 through 6, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves, slaves of sin. Then going down to verse 17 and 18, it says, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. This is why baptism by other churches is not valid. Valid. One must be fully must fully understand what they're doing to be baptized properly. Through proper baptism we can obtain freedom from our sins. Then we can start our life anew in Christ and are free from the bonds of sin. Understanding the scriptures in regard to baptism is essential to be saved and enjoy a home in heaven. In closing, we could have looked at other religious errors and sins that happened due to lack of knowledge in regard to the scriptures. However, the ones that we have covered are good examples and sufficient to make the points intended. There are some of the common sins that we see. Thus we have learned that we, we cannot believe everything that we hear from some preacher or a church. We have been warned in the scriptures of false prophets and false teachers. We must test what is said by the Bible. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits where they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So finally, we must avoid religious error due to the lack of knowledge in God's Word. We must study God's Word. This enables us to check our beliefs by the Word of God and thus make sure that we are right. Then we can keep error out of our life. We have been warned that we will be lost by disobeying, disobeying God's Word. Hopefully this lesson has been beneficial. As an invitation given by the Lord tonight, He's extended an invitation to you. Today we have studied about the need to believe and be baptized for remission of your sins to be saved. If you have not taken this step and, to, and became a child of God, do not delay. Be baptized and start your life anew free of your sins. Then let God's word guide your life in all things, keeping away from committing sins. If you are a Christian and have fallen back into a sinful life, be restored to Christ tonight. Repent of your sins and pray to God for forgiveness. Let God's word dwell in your heart and guide you for the rest of your life. So tonight, God is calling. Now is the time to obey that calling. We are ready to assist you with your needs.